Alan, how are you? Good. We have started the webinar. Somebody pushed the start button, so we're off and running here. How are you? I'm doing good, thank you. Super. Okay. We want to welcome everybody to this webinar entitled, What Physicians and Their Advisors Need to Know About Excluded Persons and How to Make Sure You Don't Have One. And I'm very pleased to have Lester Perling here today. He is an esteemed healthcare lawyer and a great guy representing many uh, physicians and medical practices throughout Florida. And uh, Lester and I have had a few interactions on this topic, so I thought that it was something very important for us to get the word out on and, and to, quite frankly, help everyone get a better understanding of. So I'm going to, without further ado, go right to the first question, which is, does a practice really have to lose every dollar it is billed to Medicare if it has an excluded individual? And what is an excluded individual? Well, uh, why don't we start with what is an excluded individual? Um, an excluded individual, and, and by the way, there can also be excluded entities um, as well, but um, an excluded individual or entity is someone who, uh, in the context of federal health care programs, the Office of Inspector General of the Department of Health and Human Services has used its um, statutory authority to exclude the individual from participating in any federal or state health care program. And that authority is in, split into two categories. There, um, sometimes it's mandatory. For example, if a physician is convicted of any form of health care fraud, uh, paying or receiving kickbacks, things like that, the OIG must exclude the individual. Other types of um, exclusions are permissive, meaning the OIG has the discretion of whether or not to exclude. So for example, if the OIG believes the physician has been receiving kickbacks, even though that physician has not been excluded, the OIG could still, I mean convicted, excuse me, the OIG could still seek to exclude that individual. An individual or entity who is excluded um, cannot receive any federal monies um, from any provider of health care services that is getting federal money, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, um, TRICARE, Federal Employee Health Insurance Plan, or essentially any other federal health care program. Um, there is a secondary form of exclusion, which is called a disbarment. An individual can be disbarred from contracting with the federal government, uh, which normally is going to apply to other types of contractors, but it can be applied to health care providers as well under you know, probably what would be unusual circumstances. But it does exist. Um, so that, in a nutshell, very quick nutshell, is what it means to be excluded. Um, an exclusion has a definite length of time. It could be one year up to um, seven years or even lifetime. But in, it, one thing that's important to note is if a person's excluded, let's say, for five years, and five years has now come and gone, the person is not automatically reinstated, and they can still not participate in federal health care programs. So it's kind of like the exclusion is indefinite until the individual is reinstated, uh, which requires an application and approval by the OIG. So um, it's, it's um, a little bit tricky because someone could say, oh, yeah, I was excluded four years ago and for two years, so it's over now. Um, unless they're reinstated, you still can't hire them. And this would apply in a physician's office to anyone working in the office who might get paid for money that comes from the federal government, whether it's the receptionist or a physician. Um, it's also important to note that exclusion can be for things other than healthcare related crimes or activities. For example, a person could be excluded if they don't pay their student loans, and that happens to physicians fairly often. Um, Patient abuse, like a nursing aide in a nursing home, could be excluded for abusing a patient or neglecting a patient. Um, child support, a person could be excluded for not paying child support. Mm. So, so the, the 
exclusions can come from sort of different unusual places that you know you are not or not necessarily intuitive. And you might say, well, gee, this doctor has never been convicted of a crime. I don't need to worry about it. Well, maybe he didn't pay his student loans, and yeah, you do need to worry about it. So that is kind of a, a, a nutshell of, of what it means to be excluded. You're basically limited to working for someone or providing services to, if you're a physician, privately paid uh, individuals or for privately paid services, um, which could Can include healthcare. a health. Go ahead. Huh? I was going to say that could care. That could be a health care plan, like a United Healthcare or Blue Cross commercial plan is not an issue. However, a United Healthcare or Blue Cross uh, Medicaid or managed care plan or federal employee health plan or whatever is an issue. So there's a bright line between something that is self-pay or commercially paid versus anything that has any federal money associated with it. Okay. Now, besides physicians, what other who what other individuals could be excluded? Anybody. So, so like I said, a, a someone who let's say you have someone who's coming to work as applying in your in a practice to be a nurse a nursing assistant, and they had been a nursing assistant in a nursing home, and abused a patient, they could be ex they could have been excluded for that activity. Um, they could have been involved in some fraud in the past and been excluded, you know, when they worked in a billing position. So anybody could be excluded if they fit within one of the categories. It's not based on being a, you know, being a licensed physician or any form of licensed professional. Anybody could be excluded. Okay. Um, amazing. All right, so should we go to the next the, the question on the screen, which is, does a practice, what does a practice lose if it's been billing Medicare while it has an excluded individual employed by it? Well, it, it, it's going to depend on what the excluded individual was doing. Your, your, your question says, do they really have to pay back every dollar? The answer is generally no, they don't. They're not going to. Um, the measure of damages will depend on what the person was doing. If the person was providing a direct service, let's say it's a physician, and the practice was billing Medicare for that excluded individual's services, then the measure of damages would, in fact, be everything the practice got paid for that individual. Um, on the other hand, if you're talking about a nurse or a nursing assistant, we'll say, in a medical practice, and there are no services directly billed for her, the OIG will often settle those cases based on the salary paid to her, which came, you know, which at least in part, came out of federal money if the practice was you know, participating in Medicare or Medicaid or TRICARE or any other federal health care plan. So it's going to depend on what the person was doing. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. I represent a large provider who discovered that they had a pharmacist working for them for 14 years who had been excluded when they hired her 14 years ago and never reinstated. Oh, my gosh. This was discovered when they when they applied um, for a managed care contract. The managed care plan actually found that she was excluded and notified the, the, the provider. And the provider went into self-disclose through the OIG self-disclosure protocol. And we've been negotiating the settlement of that case now literally for almost two years. The measure, the single measure of damages of the prescription that Medicaid paid for that this individual filled was all Medicaid is about fifteen million dollars. Oh my gosh! Um, that we're looking for the OIG is pretty good about settling these cases where they where they are comfortable that there was no intentional wrongdoing and and there was a you know inadvertence and a slip up. You know, and the, we've handled a lot of these disclosure cases, and the OIG has been fairly. Um, cooperative in looking at the, the, the provider's ability to pay as opposed to the potential damages and looking for alternative ways to resolve the case as they are in, in this one. Um, but that can show you how out of control it can potentially get. Um, 
and, and how difficult these cases can be. Um, like I said, we've been going back and forth on this one now for close to two years. Wow. Uh, we've recently settled one with the OIG in a self-disclosure for a hospital with an emergency room nurse, which we were able to do um, based on salary paid to her because there were no really direct services that she provided that were billed, unlike the physician. Um, so it, 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 it depends on the type of case, the type of individual, um, circumstances of the provider. Uh, but no, the answer to your slide, the question on your slide there is no. It, it generally is not going to mean that. But it is going to cost some money, clearly. Amazing. Now, if you have an excluded person, can you have them work only private pay and non-Medicare, non-Medicaid, fee-for-service, but have other people well, in your organization handling Medicare? Is that something that you need no, to say? No, not necessarily, because you, what you would have to prove is that you paid them purely out of private pay money. So are you going to be able to demonstrate that that's the case? So let's say you're a typical doctor's office, you know, and you just get receivables and you put them in the bank and you pay people and make your payroll. And you have this individual that's excluded who's a receptor, who, you know, is a nurse or whatever, let's say a nurse. Um, the question is, how are you going to prove, and is your burden, how are you going to prove that not a single penny that you received from the federal government went to that nurse? There are types of providers where you could theoretically do that. So let's use a physician for an example. Let's say a, a, a medical practice has a large commercial United Healthcare contract, and that physician only sees, and it's fee for service, that physician only sees those United patients and gets paid a percentage of the revenue collected from United only after it's collected. So you can actually trace, if you will, essentially trace the money. I mean, we generally recommend to providers that they don't do that. If someone's been excluded, they're essentially a pariah. You don't touch them. Um, there right. are some rare circumstances that can make it possible to isolate the money. Um, but again, you know, if you have a problem, it's going to be your burden to show you didn't pay them out of federal funds. Because the presumption is going to be that you did. So the better rule for a provider is if they if they're excluded or excluded you know or not reinstated you don't hire them and if they now if they're working for you now you fire them wow I mean our advice to people is simple when they call and say we've discovered that Mary Jane is excluded you know and she's working for us in our building department what do we do say so we fire her this afternoon that's that Wow. Okay. Shall we go to the next slide? All right. What databases do you check and how often do you have to check them? don't have the websites at my fingertips, but if you go to um, the Office of Inspector General's website, and I'll give you the, the website address if you bear with me for one moment. Um, The main website, their homepage, is oig.hhs.gov, and right on their homepage it has exclusions. You can click on that, and they have an online searchable database. It's very easy to do. You just need the person's name. You may need their birth date, you know, because there can obviously be a number of people that have the same name. Um, and then the... Um, we had other... Uh, procurement bar website is through the uh, General Services Administration. And if anyone's interested, I can provide the website to them if they send me your Allen an email. They should be every employee, and if you get any federal funds, every single employee and every contractor and every company you contract to do anything, even your housekeeping company, um, your biohazardous waste company, I don't care who it is, you should be checking upon the beginning at the beginning of the relationship and at least annually. 
And every employee handbook, every contract that you have with an independent, independent contractor should obligate them to disclose to, to you um, when the, if, they have, if they become excluded or even, for that matter, under investigation. But certainly, at least, if they become excluded. Um, you know, it, ideally, you would check it quarterly, but that could get burdensome. You know, if you're a small enough practice, it's easy to do. But in a larger entity, that can sometimes be a problem. But it, at a minimum, it should be checked annually. Keeping in mind, if they got excluded, you know, let's say, you know, three months, nine months ago, you're going to owe some money back for that period of time. Wow. Okay. I guess you have to be careful to make sure that people give you the right name, the right social security number. What if they give you a a fake name and a fake social security number, and it turns out they're an excluded person. Are you still in the same you, type? I mean, you, well, obviously, I mean, you could still be liable. Um, uh, obviously, you may have a defense, at least at paying double or triple damages, because you, you, you know, when you're in this situation, you may not be able to get away with only paying back the single damages, how whatever they may be. You, the government's going to look for more than that. But in that situation, if you were clearly duped and you could not have discovered it yourself, um, you know you may be able to get, negotiate a, a better deal than you otherwise would. Okay. All right. If someone goes through the trouble of having a phony, you know, they have a, for, a phony driver's license with a phony birth date and a phony name and all of that, you know, you're likely the government's going to understand that. If you don't bother to even check, if you don't even look at their driver's license just accept their application with a phony name and a phony date of birth and a phony social security number, and you, you have no due diligence at all in your organization, the government probably isn't going to be so sympathetic. OK. All right. So shall we go to the next question? Okay. Can you hire an excluded individual and completely insulate them from providing Medicare services? You did already answer that. How does an excluded individual affect Medicare HMO and Medicaid HMO services? Same, federal funds. And I've actually discovered that it is not uncommon for the provider to actually learn that is how they, are, they have an excluded individual. I mentioned that case of the one provider with the pharmacist. I've had two experiences now with medical different medical practices that when they've gone to get a new physician or one I think may have been a nurse practitioner credentialed by a managed care plan. The practice didn't bother to check the exclusion list. The managed care plans, believe me, are extremely fastidious about doing so and discovered that and, and reported that to the practice. So um, again, because Medicare HMOs or Medicaid HMOs are both paid from federal state funds, the exclusion applies to them as well. Okay. Okay. What do you do, Lester, as a lawyer, if you represent an excluded individual besides telling them to go to law school? <laughs> yeah, uh, become a plumber. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> it kind of depends on what they do. The reality is, um, it really is going to depend on what they do. Let's say the person is a a plastic a reconstruct plastic and reconstructive surgeon. You know, so they could theoretically open up a cash plastic surgery business that they could do if they're excluded. Now, keeping in mind, in Florida, under current law, if you're excluded, and it doesn't really matter why you're excluded, you will lose your license. Mm. It, it may not be until the next renewal period if you're, you know, let's say you're, you've just been renewed. Um, but the state, the Board of Medicine, is forbidden under law from renewing a license of an excluded individual. Um, absent a couple of grandfathering exceptions and whatnot to get a little complicated. But so it could very much, and that apply, could apply to nurses and other licensed individuals as well. So the answer to this question is it really depends on, on what the person does, who they are. You know, some people will have options. Um, under the new laws with the licensure limitations, which are um, 
being challenged in court on various constitutional grounds. But nonetheless, as the laws are written on the book, even if you could be a cash business surgeon, like a plastic surgeon, um, you're going to lose your license at some point. It may be a year and a half from now, but you're likely going to lose your license. Um, so you really are looking at getting out of the business if that happens. Very sad. And are you seeing situations where doctors are being excluded for things that really you would not have expected it to be a career-ending move or a career-ending call? Um, I mean, you know, clearly when in, in the permissive exclusions, you know, the, the, the government, the OIG has discretion, and I think that they are, in the last several years, certainly have become more aggressive with their, the use of that discretion. Um, yeah. And part of that is just the environment, is, is, well, not part of it, that's to a large degree, you know, the environment that we're in, the degree of health care fraud, the amount of political pressure, you know, on that subject. So the OIG, you know, doesn't have much of a sense of humor when it comes to this stuff. Um, you know, we certainly have a lot of clients who have had um, various types of sanctions occur that could have supported a permissive exclusion that never get excluded. They don't hit the OIG radar, where the OIG also, of course, does not have enough resources to try to exclude everybody that they theoretically could exclude. Um, you know, they got to use their resources on those that are mandatory. And then in terms of those that are permissive, they try to use their resources on the more egregious behavior um, to set examples like any prosecutor does, you know, to send messages to the healthcare community, look, if you do that like this guy did, you're gonna get, you know, you're gonna get in trouble. You may not go to jail, but you're gonna lose your meal ticket um, at the very least. Um, so all of those things go into the OIG's consideration of whether or not to pursue a permissive case. Um, and certainly, you know, a lot of cases, much like if you're speeding down the freeway, you you go undetected. Um, but, you know, it's to some degree of the look of the draw, it's also to some degree what the issue might be at any given point in time. But it, it's not something you necessarily want to roll the dice on, I wouldn't, for sure. All right. Well, Lester, that was very, very helpful. Does anything else come to mind that you think people should know about this topic? I, I think, you know, from an, from a you know, employer or medical practice point of view, you know, the main takeaway is you need to, one, be aware of this, and, and two, understand that you've got to do the background check, not only, you know, both at the time of hire and on some regular basis. And if you do happen to find that you've got someone working for you, or you whether an employee or a contractor, that you have to take, you know, prompt corrective action. Um, and then you're going to have to consider whether or not you disclose it to the government, um, re repay money, et cetera. But you got to at, at least at first be aware of it and then take the corrective, corrective action. Um, and to remember that it applies, like I said, not only to individuals but to entities as well. A company can be excluded. So, um, for example, a, an employer of an excluded individual that doesn't take corrective action could be excluded for that reason, um, or be subject and or be subject to civil money penalty. Um, you know, so it, it's a fairly these are fairly broad-reaching um, administrative penalties that it's got to be very leery of. And this provider I mentioned to you that with the pharmacist, the, the large provider, inpatient, outpatient, believe it or not. They had no clue that this was even an issue until this came up from the managed care plan. OK. Very good. Well, Lester, we sure appreciate this and all the help you give to our clients and to us on many different areas. Uh, this has been the, oh, let me remind you that tomorrow, December 5th, 1230 PM, we're going to be talking about the whistleblower threat. Do you have it, and what can you do about it? And I think everybody knows they have the whistleblower threat. So people do need to watch this, and we'll look forward to talking to you about it tomorrow. All right. Have a good evening. You too. Have a great day, evening. Thanks, everybody.